I have advanced the argument um, so that about three quarters of the book is really about what a non-monetary society that we could transition towards from our current state might look like and how we might do that from um, coming from the point of view of quite a few different movements like the degrowth movement, which I've been associated with, ecofeminism um, and uh, a range of environmental movements. Um, so I think that's enough, Michael, and uh, we can go on and listen to Terry, who's actually part of a kind of 21st uh, and 20th century movement, late latter 20th, 20th century movement, um, that is part of these kind of suite of movements or going in this similar direction. Thank you for that. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, so, okay, so I'll start talking about my book. So, so I started doing this research um, at the end of 2019. I did um, some, in, some interviews with people in Australia, the UK, Norway, the United States uh, and Bali, and um, that was specifically for the book. Um, before that, I'd done research in Africa and had, had many um, interviews, uh, so, some of which were with people who were involved in an amazing permaculture project in, in Zimbabwe. Um, as well as that, I did a textual analysis of the canon of the three major permaculture books um, and looked at the journals and websites of permaculture activists. So my, my research is based on that, but, but also, of course, on participant observation of the permaculture movement over an extremely long period, almost since 1978, when the first book came out. Um, uh, it, it, it's hard to, uh, in defining permaculture, what, what, what you find if you're not involved in the movement is that if you ask people what permaculture is, you won't necessarily come away with a very good idea of it. And that's because uh, it relates to, there are three different substantive definitions of permaculture historically. The first one defines it as uh, perennials, uh, an agricultural system based on perennials rather than annuals. So cereal crops are replaced by nuts and fruit and so on. Uh, by, by the second and, and probably the most important book uh, in 1988, M Mollison was just by it, uh, Bill Mollison, um, the designer's manual, it becomes defined as sustainable agriculture uh, and settlement design. And then in the, in the third book by David Holmgren, it's defined in terms of a systems theory of uh, developing sustainable systems for a sustainable society. And the, these definitions, as you can see, are quite different. What, what I found in interviewing permaculture people is that there's a contrast between how they define permaculture, which is mostly in terms of David Holmgren's third uh, definition, which makes it a really broad uh, you, you know, topic uh, and and their and their and their practice. So why they while they're saying that permaculture can be applied in any area of life to create a sustainable society, what they're actually doing in their permaculture careers is some uh, part of agriculture. You know, whether that's backyard food gardening, instructing people in that um, uh, landscape design, or or working on a small farm, um, community supported agriculture, or teaching permaculture the main sort of things people are doing. So I won't go on about that uh, anymore, except to say that this, this is, is an interesting uh, contradiction between what people say is permaculture, uh, which sometimes seems a bit obscure, and what they're actually doing. Um, the next chapter of the book on permaculture is the social movement, and I contrast three possible ways of looking at that. One is the kind of classic social movement from uh, social, sociological studies, which defines permaculture, um, you know, like it's a, a, a many-headed or, as they say, polycephalous social movement network, egalitarian, a flat structure. Um, people independently cr cr create permaculture groups in different parts of the world and, and take off from there, and, and they're pretty well independent of each other. Um, even though they share ideas in common, the the second way of looking at it is is like as as a as a discourse based on three canonic texts. So the first one's Permaculture One, then there's the Designer's Manual, and and the, last, the most recent one is David Holmgren's Principles and Pathways. 
Um, and, and certainly, like, when you interview um, permaculture people and they explain what permaculture is or they start talking about it, you'll find that they make mention of ideas from these three canonic texts. So even in, in Chikuka in Zimbabwe, um, people explaining their gardens and how, and how they, their gardens work would cite ideas from Bill Morrison's designer's manual. Same thing in Bali and, and, and certainly in the, in the First World um, interviews that I did. Um, so, so in that sense, um, permaculture is based upon, uh, upon that. Now, and then the, the third, the third way of looking at permaculture, which kind of relates to that is to say that it's, um, in some ways it's like a cult in the sense that it has, uh, founders whose ideas are massively well respected and so on. And, and I talk about that as a charismatic foundationalism. And, and what I'd say about that is it's a charismatic foundationalism based upon the text. What I also point out in that chapter is that um, these charismatic founders are nevertheless, they don't have authority or top-down control. And a key example um, is a Bill Morrison who tried to exclude various permaculture teachers because he was worried they weren't following the, the true ideas of permaculture. And he, he, he there was an embarrassing failure. He failed to get rid of them. And in fact, they continued to organise the Australian movement uh, despite his, his, his problems with them. Um, probably uh, the chapters that are, um, there are three chapters that are probably uh, of, of most interest to, to the Marxist educational project, which is, the first one is the strategies of, uh, and visions of permaculture. Um, now, okay, so we associate, and, and, and in a sense, why permaculture has such a bad reputation in sections of the left is because we associate it with the, with what you could call an anti-political strategy, and and a classic of this is uh, Bill Mollison in in the Global Gardener series, stro strolling across the misty paddock, and saying, you know, I used to uh, in, in my, involve myself in, in blockades and forest blockades in Tasmania and so on. And I realised this wasn't getting anywhere. And what we need to do is um, start constructing alternative society from the ground, from the grassroots, from the ground up uh, through, through gardening and through, through um, you know, creating our own food supplies and stuff like that. Um, and, and, and then he says, you know, any, anyone can live well, da, da, da. And he looks over his, his, his garden, you know, like, all you need is uh, some sun and soil and, and stuff like this. And, and I mean, I, I mean, one of the obvious things you could say about that is the very middle class um, first world perspective on, on the way things are. And a lot of people around the world, uh, on the idea of having access to a farm sufficient to grow food, your own food is like a pipe dream. Um, anyway. Anyway, so this is the anti-political strategy. And what I found in the interviews is that quite a few um, permaculture people like that because they find, uh, they've found the, their experience of the left very frustrating. You don't get anywhere. You're involved in endless demonstrations and nothing happens. Uh, whereas with permaculture, at least you're out there doing something. So like a classic phrase is from Lockie in Newcastle, who's a landscape, permaculture landscape designer, and he goes, uh, I'm changing the world, even if it's only one backyard at a time. Um, so, so that that, that sentiment was um, was copied by a number of interviewees, um, and 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 reveals something about and, and both key key, key uh, interviewees on the on this would say it's better for my mental health to be doing this and than continuing with the sort of leftist critique, which is very depressing. Um, now, I found that very interesting, and I think it is certainly one of the strengths of the permaculture movement. But what I also found in, in, in doing the interviews is that a lot of permaculture people are critiquing that approach. You know, like they're critical of that approach to an extent. Like they'll say things like, um, you know, the idea of a permaculture being everyone in their own farm, their own castle and so on, I really find that ridiculous and it's just completely impractical and dot, 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 you know. And so um, and what, what they talk about is permaculture reaching out to other uh, political movements so that, that, are, that have allied and similar goals to, to those of permaculture. So, you know, for example, uh, a, a woman who's a part of a cooperative in Wales running a community-supported agriculture farm said, you know, like, we, we need government um, to, to step in to try and change land ownership rules so land's just not owned by an aristocratic elite in the UK. Uh, and, and then she talked about her support for Jeremy Corbyn and 
um, the, uh, the, the Welsh um, Nationalist Party and, and, and their involvement in the um, Land Workers Union and things like that. So, and, the, and this, this is, is an equally common perspective within the permaculture movement at the moment. Okay, so the next part of that same chapter is about the different visions of permaculture uh, in terms of a post-industrial society. Like, okay, say so Mollison um, and Holmgren use the term industrial to refer to the current system. And so one of the things you could, it's important to realise from coming from the left about permaculture is that it is a movement devoted to system change. It's quite explicit about that. And, and, and the term that permaculturists would probably prefer is not post-capitalist, but post-industrial in the sense that they, like, like many cr critiques of uh, from the environmentalists uh, of indus industrial society, they amalgamate the Soviet Union type of economy to, to the capitalist one and go, these are all examples of industrial society. That's what we need to get away from. Um, all right. So what, what, what does that look like? You know, okay. So <laughs> basically there are four versions and I'll talk about the two in the middle first. These two are, are the, like the strongest uh, visions in permaculture for, for how others, the future should look. And this is coming from the canonic texts, um, or in one case anyway, and, but also from the interviews. Okay, so the one that that's most fits with the canonic text is, is what I call the town and market bioregionalism vision. So it env envisages a basically a ruralization of the population uh, and that in each, every, every rural village, there's a sort of democratic process which, which um, controls and uh, t takes uh, control of small ethical businesses running a market, a small market economy. So the, so the large multinational corporations are not part of this vision. Uh, and the state, insofar as there is one, is, is a coordinated federation of, of these villages into a bioregional assembly which makes decisions for the, for the bioregion. So, so a bioregion, the idea comes from Kirkpatrick's sale uh, I think in 1987 or something like that. Um, and, and it basically means, you know, like a watershed or something like that that's got various biological features. So I found this vision. It was interesting, really, the people who, um, with one exception, there was one person who, who absolutely endorsed this vision. It was uh, totally in, in sync with this. Um, but but the other the other three or four people who, who, who came close to this, or five of them, you know, like, of the 19 interviews or whatever, like um, came close to this were people who um, also envisage cities, you know, like, so that's a bit different. And they, and what they'd say is that we, cities can be made sustainable and the surrounding bioregion can support them so long as this is done sustainably. So um, for example, Andrew Faust in New York, the one who, who tipped you out of the, the commons building, um, <laughs> he's he, like, that was his, that's his vision. Uh, and he doesn't envisage the, the dismantling of New York, but it's maintenance. Um, okay, so that's the bioregional vision. So that's one, one, one of the main two main tendencies. The other one is what I call radical reformism. Basically, it involves the massive regulation by the state of environmental outcomes within the context of a national state. Um, and, and this is really a dominant uh, vision of system change in the environmentalist movement as a whole, and it's not at all surprising to find it in permaculture. So things like a universal basic income, taxing the rich, a shorter working week, uh, a government support for cooperatives, um, you, you know, a, a market, a supervising a market monetary economy, um, the, uh, the steady state economy idea, you know, caps on resource use and auctions for cap and trade systems. So, so these are all ideas which are also current and, and, and fairly dominant in the permaculture movement. So these two strands are the most common ideas of system change in the permaculture movement. At the outlying edges on both the left and the right, okay, so on the right, there are some people in permaculture who look forward to a digitalised post-capitalist economy uh, you know, where, 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 where the, into the possibilities of the internet and digital communication allow a much more flat, non-hierarchical form of capitalism to develop. Uh, I only found that in the interviewees from, the, from Bali. Um, that was obviously in, influenced by uh, Petra Kelly, um, one of the leading figures in, in, in IDIP, the Indonesian Permaculture Movement. 
Um, okay, so that's on one outlying end. And on the other end, there are a few people in permaculture who are socialists who say that we need to confront the capitalist class and, and we can't, we, and unless we do that, we can't really implement a, a post-industrial permaculture future. And also there's a few anarchists. And this also reflects what I also found in going to permaculture conferences, both in Australia and, and international conferences of permaculture, very much like that. Okay, so that's that. And then the next thing I want to talk about is um, permaculture practice. Okay. So have I got time for that? You have plenty of time. Okay, so so then the the the, the um, I, this is a very tricky topic in a way. I mean, there's there are quite a few um, leftist writers who who have a, a view of prefiguring uh, a post capitalist society um, through uh, let, 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 let me describe them as ethically based market business business small business enterprises um and 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 they see the these 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 ethical businesses and and workers cooperatives as continuing on into the post industrial society so the the prefiguring is complete and absolute and the, in the sense that what these organizations that are being set up now to work in in a mark in the context of the current market economy will come to dominate the ec economy, and that's what the post industrial society would look like. So, I, so in terms of that, I'm thinking of people like Gibson Graham, who talk about the community economy, um, radical geographers, um, and uh, and also Eric Olin Wright, who talks about um, I don't I can't even remember the term now, practical utopias or something like that. Um, and and my I kind of differ from that. Like okay, so when I look at prefiguring institutions which embody aspects of the market economy, I see them as hybrids of the gift economy and capitalism, in the sense that they're, they're organisations which may involve some wage labour or, or or sell products on the market or whatever, but also try to implement various kinds of goals from. Uh, permaculture ethics, like redistributing the surplus, uh, workers' control of uh, uh, um, a, a non-hierarchical working uh, working structure, um, doing ethical good works, and and, and creating products that that are actually truly useful for people rather than things that are environmentally damaging. That sort that sort of thing. So that so that these organisations try to combine these goals. So when I look, came to look at various um, descriptions of permaculture organisations. I look at it in terms in that lens. Okay, and so what did I discover with this? Yeah, I found that a really good way of looking at them. Um, and I'll just mention a few that I looked at. Okay, so the community supported agriculture farm in the UK would would be one example, um, in the sense that um, they're they're buying, um, you know, they're they're selling vegetable products on the market through a community supported agriculture scheme. Uh, but at the same time, they're doing this in a way which um, benefits nature because they're using all, all organic methods. And they're also um, helping to create some kind of community uh, control over over the means of production, you could say, because members of the co-op, you know, who buy their vegetables have an input into decision making and, and are, are making an ethical choice to buy these kind of vegetables rather than just going down to the local supermarket and so on. Um, and what, 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 I, what I found out about that is that the, there are various kind of market constraints on how, how well they can, can operate and, and, and which restrict their operation or make it difficult for them. I mean, one of the most obvious things that I discovered when looking at this organisation in some detail is that um, they're paying really low wages to the members of the co-op. Like there's eight members of the co-op and they're all, they're all earning sort of like basically bottom, bottom end of the labour market wages. And that's because they're charging their vegetables in relationship to supermarket organics now, uh, or, or, or supermarket vegetables. I mean, in other words, people, are, even though people are committed to buying uh, vegetables that are ethically sourced and so on. They're not committed to the point where they're going to spend three times the amount they normally spend on vegetables to get to to get vegetables. 
uh, that are ethically sourced. So, so what that means in, in, in effect is that people, like people in the organisation are working a three-day week in the co-op and then they're doing two days of building work outside of the co-op to make ends meet or to, to, to provide a bit of extra through which they can do things like send their children to university or buy a car or whatever. Um, and it's like, so, 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 that, so there's a sort of constraint, a market constraint on, on this organisation. And, and the other thing that I, I, I say about that is that it's interesting um, to how, how, in a sense, the market, like, okay, so they're in a very unusual situation in the sense that the land that they own is actually owned by the parents of one of the members of the co-op. So it's very vulnerable. You know, like if a member of the co-op gets the pip with them and decides to leave, they've, they've lost their land. Uh, they, don't, they don't own it in the normal sense. Uh, so, so in one say, way, that's a classic example of a hybrid of the gift economy and capitalism in the sense that the parents are donating land for, for, the, for the use of the community to do an, eth an ethical project. Uh, but, but in the other way, what we can also say about it is it indicates how difficult it is to, to get access to land to run a cooperative organic agriculture project. And, and, um, and, and Alice, who um, describes this situation to me, says exactly that. That you know we need we need we need a change of uh, at the level of the state to make it easier for ordinary people, you know you don't have to spend half a million dollar uh, pounds to become a peasant is, is the way she puts it, um, and so okay so that's that's one example. Uh, some other examples I, I, I look at are the Chukukwa project in in Zimbabwe. Um, oh my God. It's, it, I don't know if it's such a, lo, a, a, a complicated to explain it, but okay. So this is a project that started off in 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 this, um, a clan area. It's like about 15 kilometres. It's all sort of hills and valleys. And what happened is during during the 60s and, and, and 50s and 60s, the, this clan was pushed onto this area of land, which was like about like a a fifth of the land that they'd previously occupied. And part of the land was taken for a state forest and part went across the border to another country and so on and so forth. Anyway, the end result was uh, um, in a tip scenario very typical of this part of Africa. They overgrazed and had too many cattle uh, and they, um, they, they were planting uh, maize on, on the hillside. So there was huge amounts of erosion, da, da, da. da. So they, they formed a community project to try and, and deal with this problem. And they formed working parties uh, of volunteers um, who, who um, cut contour, um, contour buns across the hillside. And, and, and then each individual, uh, and they fenced off the gullies so that trees would grow in the gullies and uh, stop erosion, all sorts of stuff like this. They planted trees on the tops of the hills to take in water and absorb water to stop the sort of um, huge amounts of erosion that were happening. Uh, all of these were uh, in the sense of a, g a gift economy. These are all um, pr volunteer projects run by the community as a whole. People were not paid money and so on. What, what makes it a, ca a capitalist or, or the parts of it that make it part of the, the market economy are things like uh, the current, um, the, the staff of the, of the project itself who are coordinating uh, manage all, all of these re um, reforms and changes even. Like this project has now gone for 20 years and the transformation is, is amazing. Anyway, the staff who, who manage this project are all paid. They're paid by international donation, but, but, but they are still wage workers in the sense of having to get money and get an income. Uh, the car that they use is bought, you know, is bought on the market and, and an absolutely necessary part of their work um, and so on. So, uh, and also like, okay, so the individual plots of land which people own as their family family farm uh, are also owned individually, even though it's under uh, a community title. The, the reality is that it's passed on and inherited and so on from one's parents. So again, what we find is a, uh, is a project which, which combines elements of, of the market economy and elements of the gift economy. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, and then when I looked at the, I, I'll just now talk a bit about some of the, um, the, the interviewees, like, um, again, again, what we, what we find is that permaculture careers can be quite difficult. Um, like, 
Penelope from the UK. Okay, so she and her partner bought into a, a community um, community farm where people had to pre- prepare a certain proportion and and proving that it, that a proportion of of their income, a certain proportion of their income, had been sourced from the farm itself in order to retain their 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 membership of the cooperative and their ownership of that land. Well, they worked themselves to death. Like the husband was working a 16-hour day sorting out the wa- water and hydraulics for the whole cooperative. Um, and 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 the, the person that I interviewed, Penelope, uh, was, was was preparing vast amounts of food for their students and, and, and growing a huge amount both for, for herself and her own consumption and da-da-da. And like, like uh, they, they were very strapped for cash and, and they found that as their children were reaching adulthood that there were more expenses involved in that and, and, that, and, and, and it was very difficult for them. So they, they did this for a, for, for a number of years, like I think probably about 10 years. <clears throat> and then at the end of all this, what happened was that the house burnt down to burnt to the ground completely and just got demolished. And when 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 her partner rang her up, he, he said, "Oh God, thank God, we're free now." And so they left. They left. And it's like <clears throat> this is an example. My, my, the moral I draw from this, if you like, is that these hybrids are, are really useful experiments in prefiguring a gift economy or a non-market economy or a post-capitalist economy, or however you want to look at it. But at the same time, they come with various costs. And, and that this is the main strategy of permaculture as a political strategy and that it works up to a certain point. But what, what, what you don't get away from, in a sense, is the constraints of the marketplace and that uh, to, to, to achieve, you know, like a, a permaculture ethics or whatever, you, you would need a much more thorough um, cha- system change than the one that's uh, created just through this practice alone. Um, Okay, uh, I, I probably should finish on the, the, la- the last chapter of the book was on gender and colonialism. <clears throat> and there are critiques of the permaculture movement on, on the grounds of gender, um, you know, like that men are, are typically the ones who, who, who run the um, permaculture design course training, the PDC, um, that in permaculture couples that it's typical for the, for the man to do the sort of outdoor hard outdoor work and the wife to do the, the um you know like the domestic work um and often in those sort of couples the man is also the the, the one who, who has the public face and presents permaculture to the world and so on uh, and what i say about this is that um the these critique and also not to mention the fact that the the, the permaculture canon was written by two guys and all that um and what i'd say about that is that um The permaculture movement also, can, you know, in, includes a, a, a lot of really uh, influential women within women who are very influential within the movement, um, and that a lot of uh, there are permaculture people who are, are not doing it like that. You know, like single women who are running farms themselves or, or doing their own permaculture instruction, um, <clears throat> or, or lesbian couples or gay couples. Um, and, 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 and that there's a critique of this from within the movement itself and various um, networks are being set up for women permaculture people and things like that. Uh, so so I, I, I'd say that the, the permaculture, uh, in, in permaculture, patriarchy is contested rather than simply dominant. Um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, like, and I suggest various things that permaculture could do to improve the situation. In terms of, of colonialism, there's been a critique of permaculture as colonialist. The, the first basis of this critique is the idea that permaculture pretends to have invented a whole lot of technologies which were actually invented by Indigenous people around the world. Um, the, 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 ne- the next part of the uh, anti-colonialist uh, critique of permaculture is to point out, and this is certainly true, that in settler colonial societies like, you know, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, well, whatever. I mean, it's not really, doesn't fit that. But um, there's a sort, a sort of middle class white hegemony in, in, uh, in the membership, you know, like of permaculture. Um, and the last part of the critique is to talk about 
land ownership in settler society. So, so in other words, anybody who owns land uh, like a farm in the United States is taking it, you know, it's part of a process by which this land was taken away from the, the original indigenous owners of the land, uh, and true in Australia, obviously. <clears throat> and, 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 and in a sense, uh, there are some permaculture people like Heather Jo Flores in the United States who are demanding that um, these settlers give the land back. You know, what, how can you say you're in favour of permaculture ethics and you're still hanging on to this land? <clears throat> so, uh, so I, I, I mean, there's a lot to be said about this and I, I'll just sort of sketch a few ideas. Um, one, one, one is I think that um, permaculture is more and more acknowledging the provenance of permaculture and Indigenous knowledge. And, and certainly those moves should be supported. And it's really important for permaculture people to, to say things like, you know, this technique was invented by so-and-so and so-and-so. Uh, like, you know, like, for example, growing maize with, um, you know, with velvet beans is a t technique developed by the Kekchi of, of Guatemala. Um, you know, like, that's the sort of thing that pe people should be saying in permaculture certainly agree with that. On the other hand, well, what I do also think is that permaculture doesn't make much sense outside of agricultural science. It's really, um, to an extent, collects these indigenous technologies and, and, and creates a sort of scientific synthesis of, 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 of what's available. Uh, I think this, this combination should be acknowledged uh, more. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the of the white hegemony of permaculture membership, I think this is absolutely right. But it's also uh, I'd also say about this that it also applies to the working class in these countries, uh, in the sense that permaculture needs to reach out to the working class and, and broaden its membership, and I and I think that uh, that that has to come through. You know, strategies that don't depend upon people having their own back, large backyard or their, or their own land and so on. So community gardening strategies are a really good way to go. But I'd also say about this that what, what this critique ignores is the fact that permaculture is really vibrant and strong in, in, in various countries of the global south, uh, you know, like Vietnam, the Philippines, uh, South Africa, um, <clears throat> Zimbabwe, obviously, and so on and Bali, not to mention, Indonesia, yeah. And, and, and in, in these contexts, I mean, there's no white hegemony in these contexts at all. These, in these situations, the permaculture organisation is run by local people. India is another example. So, so this critique is, is, is particularly relevant to, to rich first world countries and settler societies. Uh, and it has less purchase in, in some other examples of the permaculture movement. And that yeah, and, and and as I said, within these rich settler societies, permaculture really needs to change, you know, like to emphasise those kind of strategies which work well with people who are working class um, and don't own land and are not likely to and so on. So I'll finish up with that, <clears throat> so, uh, I think, and invite comments, whatever. Great. So thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, those who would like to ask questions or make comments, if you can, write the word stack in chat. And uh, otherwise, I'll try to keep track of you raising your hand. Um, okay, Shane, you're ready right away. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Terry, thanks for that. Um, I do have the book. I just haven't only just started it, though. <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted... My experience, I mean, I've had long experience in and out of permaculture. And I, one of the things that I, has always struck me is that they have sort of quite a critical analysis of nature and the exploitation of nature. But often the politics that attach to it isn't, um, at least didn't mention this, it's conspiracy theory. You know, it, it immediately jumps from a sort of nature by design to, oh, yes, like up here, the, the sort of Trumpism is really strong in the group. You know, and I managed to keep it off the off the permaculture Facebook page, but that's what they wanted to, when they talk about politics, that's what they want to argue with me about, you know? So it's, it feels like the, whatever the latest conspiracy theorism is in the air, it seems that they seem to pick it up and have quite strange ideas, you know? Uh, so I find myself in, these people are close friends of mine, so I quite admire them, but but the, but the, the, the conversation moves from what I think is a quite sensible 
football critique, you know, and uh, something I can learn about how to grow things better in my garden and stuff to, uh, to uh, oh, well, hey, life didn't originate on, on, on the planet. It came from, alien, from outer space or something. You know, it just takes these jumps to these places. But particularly the Trumpism has been strong up here, not because they're particularly right wing, but just because that seems to be the way they connect with the bigger politics. So I just wondered if you, what you found, if, if anything about that. Yeah, totally. Um, there's no analysis in the permaculture canon of, of the, ca the capitalist system and how, how the capitalist system creates environmental damage. Uh, and so, so because it's not in, in the canon, it's not, it's not part of permaculture, which means that people come into permaculture without, without uh, um, ha having access to that, to that critique, if you like, <clears throat> um, and, and, and their politics reflect that. Um, on the other hand, I think it's very much um, a situational thing and it depends upon particular networks. <clears throat> and, and, you know, like, like um, the, the border of uh, New South Wales and Queensland, north, northern New South Wales and Queensland is, is a particular home to um, that sort of conspiracy theory um, type of alternative, if you like. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I, in the interviews, Quite, quite a lot of permaculture people will talk about capitalists and capitalism and, mm, um, mm, you know, uh, and like um, give, give a fairly, um, you know, leftist analysis of, of the way things are. Like, for example, Andy Goldring, who's uh, the president of, of the permaculture organisation in the UK. I mean, and he has been for 20 years. Uh, it talks about capitalists without without any hesitation, you know. So, <clears throat> I, I mean, you know, and, and he sees perfect culture in, in the UK as moving into an alliance with various other leftist forces. Um, on, on the other hand, I mean, what I'd say about his position is that he's in favour of system change to radical reformism. So, I mean, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be critical of that. But on the other hand, it, it certainly is a leftist informed idea of what the system is. Um, and and, and I, you know I found quite a lot of that in my in my interviews and I don't I don't um, I I think when you look at a specific group of, of permaculture people who are madly into conspiracy theories and uh, you know like I, okay like David Holmgren's recent um, postings I mean <clears throat> the term deep state is being used right so I mean I find the term deep deep state massively misleading in the sense that w what it does is is it doesn't um, allow you to attribute motives or look at or look at interests you know what it, it basically says whatever a government is doing that's obviously the result of deep state these forces that lie behind the government and kind of pull the strings but what these forces are what their motivations might be what their interests might be is le is left completely open and so the the term deep state becomes irrefutable because basically anything yeah. that a government does could be an example of deep state um, and, and all I'd say about that is that that, that is that is a, um, a a way in which permaculture people can can go, but they don't all go in that direction. And I, and I find that um, I, I you know like um, yeah, a lot don't a lot of permaculture people will not hes as I said will not hesitate to talk about the cap the capitalists or the capitalist class or something. Mm -hmm. Terry, I put myself on stack, and uh, my question is in formation, uh, but I find that there is something related in all three of the uh, different permaculture orientations that you mentioned, all the stages of it from the late 70s into the 90s. Uh, that is interesting, and I'm wondering if there are permaculture communities that are, say, tied in with, say, degrowth collectives or co-housing collectives that are more conscious of the change they're trying to bring about than merely an agricultural uh, sustainability, but a, a way of manageable resource use that a planet with 8 billion people is able to survive with and, and, um, the 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 um, movement, for example, in deindustrialized Detroit was that some of the organs, not a permaculture movement, but a, a lot of organizing was done to get the, po the various 
parts of the Detroit population that was their jobs were taken away, their homes were being taken away or burning down because the landlord got more from the insurance than from the rent, et cetera. There were these agricultural, uh, there were farmland, there was farmland developed where auto plants used to be. Now, you well point out that unless you actually have the land in your possession as a collective, the, those who have the ground rent come and take it right back. And some of the, that farmland was retaken back by those that held title. But I, I do think that a left that can make it into a transitional period will need a lot of transitional methods such as permaculture to get there. And, and, and it's not just a feeling. I, I, I feel that in the way of taking the depleted soils and uh, chop down trees and bringing a, a livable, breathable environment back is part of building a democracy, dem a broader democratic movement. Now, some of what you are saying about the 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 culture within perma the the human culture within the permaculture movement is maybe not that democratic, and maybe is pyramidical with a lot of there could be some authoritarian, not necessarily dictatorship, but just the uh, uh, a reserve to be making all the calls for the next stages rather than uh, a, a, a democratic process emerging within that. But I, um, I just wonder if there, it's not really a question, I'm more trying to discover, are there um, um, some groups that are taking in other types of transitional, oppositional um, uh, movements um, that you've noticed in your your investigations around the world. Yeah. Okay. Um, I well, well, I think that what I should point out first is that um, <clears throat> permaculture has always been uh, into degrowth, even though uh, and 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 the, the more recently permaculture. People will mention the use the term degrowth. It's not just that um, <clears throat> the de facto that they're into degrowth. The term that's been used by David Holmgren always for, in, in relationship to this is energy descent, which relates to the peak oil theory uh, that that you may be familiar with. Um, and 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 so so in 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 that sense, de, um, degrowth has always been a part of permaculture. On the other hand, organisationally speaking, there, there there's a degrowth movement and a permaculture movement. And and like, I don't know. I think there's there's this crossover in memberships, but I think these organise uh, as as movements, they <clears throat> they're separate. And and my my hunch, which is sort of um, certainly backed up by by my own research, is that in Europe, degrowth uh, is 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 much more the way, and uh, the term also agroecology is like the combination is more how how people look at these issues. Whereas in in the in the UK and Australia and South Africa and the United States to a to a large extent, the term permaculture is more more often you know, and the theory the ideas of permaculture are more 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 have more currency. <clears throat> so, so, so that's what I'd say about that. Um, and and certainly, you know, like in terms of, you know, do they do they see the necessity to move to uh, beyond sustainable agriculture to a degrowth economy? Absolutely, people in permaculture will always talk about that stuff. And in fact, uh, in defending um, the third definition of permaculture, that's what they'll often say: we don't, we we don't, we're not just on about sustainable agriculture. We we need a total system change. Uh, to a degrowth economy, and 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 like and so so Andrew Faust in New York, who I'll talk about again, <clears throat> is 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 a classic of this because he says, look, in my courses, I talk about the circular economy. I bring in, in various people from this other perspective, and um, what we need to do in New York is to occupy the brownfield sites that are now you know, unused and, and use them for sort of biogas um, generators and, and solar plants and wind power and stuff like that. And, and, and you know, um, put, put agriculture into the cities and so on. So he's completely, um, 
aware of the sort of stuff you're talking about in Detroit. And I mean, it, and like um, other Bernard, Bernard Farah in, in, in California, there's also a, a group of black people from Oakland who are permaculture people who are working very similar strategies to the ones that you're talking about in Detroit, but under the name of permaculture. So um, like, yeah, so, 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 so I'll go on to something else that you said about that. Um, Authoritarian making calls for the whole movement. <clears throat> well, as I said, I, as I said before, I, I, I think these. I, I think that's true in the sense that um, David Holmgren is the only surviving um, leader of permaculture. Like Bill Mollison's now dead, uh, has a huge influence in the movement, but mainly through his canonic book. You know, like Pathways and Principles is really canonic. But in terms of influencing the movement, in terms of what people in permaculture believe in terms of his other writings, or even in terms of that one, it's very patchy. You know, like David Holmgren, for example, doesn't believe that a high, any high-tech economy is possible in a, in, a, in a society without fossil fuels. And he makes that quite clear, uh, and he bases this on o Odom's writing. And yet when I talk to permaculture people on the ground, they're all talking about um, solar cells and, um, you know, you know, like wind power and uh, the, the digital econ uh, digital communications, and uh, you know, um, main, uh, yeah, and the same thing with with uh, with urbanism. I mean, like in a sense, uh, the permaculture classic Mollison's designers manual obviously envisages rural ruralization, and that's repeated by Holmgren to some extent in some of his writings. Uh, and yet, when you talk to permaculture people, they're all talking about making the city sustainable. Um, and and so you know, like Maybe, yes. you can exaggerate the extent of top-down influence in permaculture because people, as as a net network polycephalous social movement, it doesn't actually operate like that, a lot of the time, anyway. Thanks, Terry. Uh, John Gullick, you are next. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm coming at you from from Brooklyn, and uh, coinc coincidentally enough, my initial introduction to permaculture was a talk or a seminar given by Andrew Faust, Center of Bioregional uh, yeah. Living at the Brooklyn Commons, <laughs> as it turns out. So um, I guess I have more of a remark to make rather than a question to ask, and I'll bounce it off you and, and see what you have to say, uh, Terry. Um, I mean, one, one notable feature of the political economic landscape here in the U.S. in the wake of uh, COVID-19 pandemic is a massive flight of capital investment um, to uh, countryside areas, rural areas, uh, massively bidding up the price of, of land and further underscoring what you said about um, the political constraints of a permaculture vision, which, you know, relies on private land ownership um, in terms of, you know, making it accessible to, to working class people and, you know, uh, economically <laughs> uh, disadvantaged people, so to speak. Um, so, you know, I have a, I have a longstanding, not very well developed, but longstanding critique of some of the petty bourgeois land ownership assumptions in certain versions of permaculture. And I, and, and, you know, Given the massive bidding up of a price of land in, say, Hudson Valley, you know, north of New York, and incidentally, not far from uh, uh, Faust's operation himself, which is sort of the outer periphery of the Hudson Valley in Ellenville, um, it just seems to me that the issue of uh, common land ownership, uh, community land trusts, conservation easements, or other techniques for decommodified land is, is, is all the more important to sort of realize a more radical version of, of permaculture practice. So I'm just curious about any comments on that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. The, the, the price of land in rural areas has also gone up in Australia as well. Um, and and what that indicates is is a lot of people uh, who who are fairly middle class are either moving to the country to retire because they they'll have more options in the context of the pandemic by moving to uh, country towns, but but also it it represents people who are planning to to work online 
uh, and you know have middle class jobs which they think they can manage on their own, um, and so on. I mean, on 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 the one on the one hand, what what you could say is that 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 represents a triumph of permaculture options in the sense that you've got a whole lot of people who 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 are now intending to to use land. Uh, you know, and, and not for commercial agricultural purposes, and maybe they'll use it for, for self-sufficiency and for for organic agriculture and stuff like that. So, uh, but but clearly what it also means is the, the chances of anybody else getting their hand on this land are, are massively diminished. Um, yeah, I mean, in, fa in, 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 in a sense, um, various kinds of strategies for... for um, <clears throat> You know, reforms to the capitalist system by by <clears throat> you know making it possible for communities to hold land and uh, and you know like you you mentioned community lands trusts, uh, easements, conservation easements, and things like that <clears throat> are, are an option. But but you know ultimately, I mean I I'm I'm in favour of you know taking control of the means of production from the capitalist class and distributing it in the community widely. You know, like so, I I I think that. Um, you have to look at what you know what's what's realistically uh, likely at the present time, and and try and work on the things that you think are most likely to to have an an impact. And 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 I, and 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 I suppose um, I'll come back to what I said before, which is that I think in terms of um, the, the urban working class and permaculture, that the way to go is is like, for example, the the um, person I talked to in Reading in the UK. Um, is is community community gardens getting council support to use public land for permaculture purposes uh, and, and involving um, the local communities in in that work um, and and I re you know I, I really and the D Detroit what happened in Detroit is an example of that too um, and yep okay so yeah thanks uh, Anitra you're on stack go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, Terry, I thought it could be useful to acknowledge and perhaps talk a little bit about David Holmgren's um, book, uh, Retro Suburbia, because in a certain sense, I don't think that you um, uh, can detract from the fact that he has actually looked at cities and he's tried to encourage people who, particularly in suburban rather than highly built up cities. He's, um, he's got a kind of strategy there. But also I know that for a degrowth collection, you've written a chapter applying these kind of principles to Melbourne, for instance. So you can sort of flesh out some of what David is arguing and, and perhaps some of the limits of that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So I, I love retro suburbia as one as David David Holtman's recent um, blockbuster book. It, it's beautifully illustrated, and uh, and each chapter is a delight to read, and so on. Um, and and what it is about is various strategies for for suburban nights in in countries where there are uh, you know uh, uh, suburbs with reasonably large blocks like between five hundred and fifteen hundred square meters um, to to do urban gardening and. Um, you know, among other things, you know, and retrofit their house to be more sustainable um, without paying a vast fortune to do that. And and I particularly like that book. And I, what, I mean, the way I, I locate it within the permaculture canon is to say that what David's doing is is two things. One one is to educate people in sustainable agriculture. So ultimately, if people move out of the cities. Um, they'll be prepared and they'll have knowledge and, you know, they will have passed that knowledge on to their children for how to do uh, sustainable agriculture in a rural setting. So that's one, one way to look at it. And the other way to look at it is, um, you know, it, it, it's it, engaging people now in creating some sort of alternative to the commercial agricultural economy within the suburbs. Um, <clears throat> Uh, well, I mean, the, the research that um, Anitra's talking about was, was on Melbourne. And, and basically what I work through on that is, you know, how much land do you actually need to sustain yourself uh, in self-sufficient agriculture within a suburban setting? And I, I did it by looking at how if people used all the road space because there were no cars and they used, it, you know, the front, the front pay, um, ver what we call it the verge, I don't know what you guys call it in the United States, but... 
you know, in front of the house and in the backyard and sort of the edges of railway lines and all of this stuff, even if we used all of that, uh, my argument is we still wouldn't have enough um, land to, to, to actually be self-sufficient without drawing uh, agricultural products from the countryside. And, and I, I also argue, in, in completely consistent with most permaculture writings, that it's unlikely that we'll have sufficient renewable energy to transport. On the one hand, we'd have to transport all of these cereal products from, from the countryside in, into the cities. And on the other hand, we'd have to transport all of the nutrients in sewerage also out into the countryside. And we need lots of energy to do that. And, and, I, and I, I wonder, I mean, I argue that it, it, we probably can't do that with fossil fuels, although obviously uh, we, we might, uh, you know, we can't do it with fossil fuels. Can we do it with renewables? Maybe not. Um, what do I think about that? Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, so that's, that's how I'm, I'm looking at that. I, I, I think the jury's out in a way in, in terms of whether cities could be made sustainable. What it would depend on would be having sufficient uh, energy to move um, goods and, you know, like agricultural products in and out and, and waste out of the cities with renewable energy, like biogas or something like that. I, I, I personally can't see it, but you never know. Um, and, but, but I think that at the same time, it's certainly a useful strategy of permaculture to be working on suburban backyards, both from the point of view of educating people and also from the point of view of sourcing some of our food in a more sustainable way. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Raphael Dreyfus, you are next. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm joining from uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I, I just wanted to ask, uh, one of the primary examples of uh, uh, sort of agroecology in the socialist circles that you hear a lot about is um, Cuba's experience in the special period after the fall of the Soviet Union. They undertook this sort of agricultural revolution of urban farming and, and small livestock on uh, rooftops and that sort of thing. Um, and so I wanted to ask if you've encountered any um, discourse between sort of this Cuban experience and uh, the permacultural canon. Uh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it goes a lot further than that. <clears throat> um, the, the Cubans invited a whole team of Australian permaculturists to go there to, to help them with this with, with this process, and 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 like key key people in the in the Cuban um, initiatives to do this were were trained by permaculture people from Australia. Um, I went to the 2013 Cuba Permaculture Conference, uh, which was an international conference, and and met some of these people who were involved in these initiatives. So, so that's all true. That said, I mean, I'm afraid my position on this is, is, is a bit um, non-mainstream, really. Um, I, I talk to a lot of, I, I mean, partly it's based on the experience of driving around Cuba in, in, in the bus and going to visit permaculture places in Cuba at the time of the conference. Partly it's um, the result of talking to various experts who were at the permaculture conference at the time, and partly it's talking to Cuban communists, you know, like supporters of the government who, who are now resident in Australia and w went through that special period. Um, <clears throat> my experience, my, 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 my feeling about that is like, okay, that um, this happened to some small and marginal extent. Uh, and, and certainly what, what the Cuban government did at this time was to create more market gardens around surrounding urban areas. Um, I'm not that sure that there was uh, a, a huge penetration of urban agriculture into Cuban cities at that time. I, I think the film on this really is a bit misleading. Um, and, and certainly um, the areas we visited you know, like, so we would go into a suburb to see a permaculture garden and there'd be two suburban gardens in a three block, block radius and there'd be another garden, which was uh, obviously the, the, the inhabitant had decided to sell bananas commercially and had planted their garden out with bananas. So that makes three gardens in all, in about a three, three block area uh, that, that within in any sense were permaculture food growing gardens. Um, 
and 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 certainly vegetables would be sourced from from the the periphery and market gardens there and brought into town and some of these were cooperatives however the, the when we traveled around the bus um the sugar cane plantations that were, were there during the soviet period had largely reverted to 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 weeds and bushland they were not being used for any agricultural purpose um and <clears throat> what 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 i've discovered from talking to people was that what happened in the special period was that um various countries um in the north and 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 supporters socialist supporters in the north um you know like in sweden scandinavia and so on donated either of goods in kind or, or or money to the cuban government during this period and the cuban government used it to buy basic staples which were sold in ration shops so basically all meat and cereals were being were being produced overseas and not actually produced locally as the film as the film on on cuba suggests um and and i think what happened after that was that with venezuela with the support of venezuela cuba was actually able to get oil basically sugar they they couldn't continue to sell sugar and 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 more recently what i think what the cuban government has decided to do is to concentrate on the tourist industry so they're putting a lot of money into the tourist industry because that makes sense and they're still buying their staple foods from overseas um and and permaculture is important in cuba but but probably not more important in cuba than it is in australia or south africa or whatever I know I know that's hard to hear and like I'm sure a lot of people won't believe me when I say this but that was my conclusion. Uh well Tom uh, was putting some things in chat do you have anything to say on that Tom or did you already write it out in chat? Yeah, I mean and this is coming from a very strong supporter of the Cuban revolution but they haven't succeeded very well with urban uh agriculture. they still import over 70% of their food um it's very difficult to get cubans who have been uh university educated to go back to the countryside or even to consider uh uh gardening in in urban areas um it's a it's a it's a cultural thing i mean you bring a kid in from the countryside and you send him to university and the last place he wants to go is uh is back to the countryside to to farm again so Cuba faces a, a lot of challenges in relation to agriculture. That's not to say there haven't been a few experiments, but it's been difficult in an uphill battle. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and I'm and what I'd also say about that is it, it it it's not um you know, this is not a critique of 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 the Cuba, Cuban society. I mean, like I I'd rather be living in Cuba than almost any other place in the developing world, so in the global south, so you know that that said i mean let's look, let's look at this kind of um construction so you know what well, i think is a socially constructed kind of uh, myth or most of of the of the cuban agricultural situation so um i just want to make sure i haven't missed any one is there Well, I I don't see another stack comment but um you know people can ask more than one question so anyone who has already asked oh there Karen you're you're go ahead. Um I just wondered if you might be able to um respond to this my thought was how, what a pity that it seems that Cuba lost an opportunity to become in effect really um disengage from capitalism as it's practiced internationally and so if they had adopted permaculture thorough going in in a thorough going way not just for urban gardens but in their countryside and do you think that it might have been possible for them to be able to sustain themselves without having to import from other countries and um 
and to have a thriving, well-nourished population. Um, yes, to t t totally. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's heaps of land in Cuba that could be used for, for, for self-sufficient, um, sustainable agriculture. Um, I, I, I don't see that as a, in any sense um, impossible. Um, but, you know, like I... I, it comes back to, you know, what, what sort of post-capitalist system do you think will work? And, I mean, I, I think there are the serious limits to, um, to, to a, a state socialist economy or, or, or in, in fact, any kind of monetary economy, radical reformist or state socialist. Um, and I, I think, you know, in order to, to develop these options, we need to move to a non-monetary gift economy. That's just my position. Um, and, and, and I think if we look at, you know, you could make various criti criticisms of the Cuban situation, you have to situate that in the context of running a monetary economy and, and having a large amount of state ownership and how, how does that translate? You know, like, I, I mean, in that context, it makes heaps of sense to do what the Cuban government's doing, um, mm. you know, prioritising tourism over ag agriculture. Yeah. Um, but, it, but in a different context, it might not. Thank you. <clears throat> Anitra? Um, yes, I was just interested, Terry, in you speaking a little bit more about that Chichao project. Um, just in terms of when you gave the broad brush um, kind of sketch of it, um, it sounded perhaps a little bit negative, whereas when I've seen your documentary and read more about it, it seemed quite an encouraging project. And I suppose some of my questions are a little bit in the same vein as the Cuban one. Like it's, what's the potential? What's, what are the limits of, of yeah, okay, um, okay. that kind of situation? So, yeah, right. Um, so I'm sorry if that sounded negative. Um, the Chikukwa project, I really recommend everyone look at the film that I made with my sister, Gillian Lay, called The Chikukwa Project. Um, yeah, I'll, probably, I'll send Michael a link to that and then and you could send it out to people if you like. Um, okay, so the, the Chikuka project started up in the 1990s and as, as I've said before, they were suffering from massive soil erosion and basically from starvation, food insecurity, which is very typical of the of areas of this part of Africa, of the rural areas. Um, they started up a small permaculture project, initially a gardening group, and then involved the whole community. And um, it's an amazing project and it's run uh, very democratically in the sense that um, each village has a number of clubs or departments as they call them, you know, like say permaculture, uh, a women's discussion group, um, preschool group, um, people living with HIV AIDS, um, you know, like okay, so they've got a, a number of different different areas which they look at, <clears throat> and um, and these 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 um, clubs in the villages um, send representatives to the central organisation um, called Seluk, um, uh, the the Chukukuri Ecological Land Use Collective, whatever, and um, and they, and then they make decisions in committee about how how, how to fund various projects so people approach them if they think something needs to be done. Uh, they have mediation, so there's another uh, department which is for mediation of conflicts in the community, conflicts over land, conflicts over land use and things like that. Um, they, what they've done through this is, uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of land use, people are basically supporting themselves on their own land through household food provision. Um, each household is attached to uh, an orchard, uh, a vegetable garden, and to cropping fields, uh, and they uh, recycle waste from from one, uh, you know, like and that small livestock. So they recycle manure from their small livestock into compost heaps, and then use that in their in their in their cropping fields and in their vegetable gardens. Um, this is completely eliminated food insecurity in, in, in those uh, in the Chukuka lands to the point where the, when there was a famine in, in an, an economic breakdown in Zimbabwe, people were coming from other areas to source food in the Chukuka lands. It, it was working so well there. Um, what more can I say about it? Um, 
Yeah, it's amazing. It's been gone for 20 years. Uh, they, they receive a minimal amount of funding uh, from uh, a German church group and from an English um, permaculture group. Um, and that's used to pay a small staff who, who kind of run, run and coordinate things. Um, what else can I say about it? No, I, I've been there, um, you know, with my sister to do the filming and then again in 2014. Um, and I, I was extremely impressed by, by how well it's working. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and so, I mean, you know, in relationship, I suppose I should say this, in relationship to the to the Cuban stuff, I mean, I think there's no doubt about the, the Chukuku project that it, that it really worked and, and shows that permaculture can actually feed people and um, there's no two ways about it that you can feed people with sustainable ag um, organic agriculture. So, yeah, um, I'm wondering, Terry, and because I am very new to this, even though when I was a teenager, I hitchhiked to Vermont and lived on a commune for a bit of time and I, I did work in the farm workers union and everything in California, Michigan and New York was a collective space with collective sharing and producing our food and cleaning up. But I am wondering if there is, besides the production of permaculture, is this permaculture movement tied to only supporting those who are within it or is there a, a component around distributing the results of the permaculture movement and if that is the or is do they merely go through some select food co-ops or this kind of thing but i would when i think of movements like this gaining ground i would think that there would have to be more than just the productive component there would need to be a culture built up around permaculture that brings people uh, into the movement maybe not as full-time practitioners, but as, as a, a kind of material basis to keep the movement uh, more sustainable while building towards sustainability. I, I don't know if that's a clear statement on my part, but... Th yeah, it's it. interesting what you say. I mean, I, I think <clears throat> definitely um, there, are, there are various initiatives in permaculture that that do this. I mean, like you, you could say uh, that in the, within the context of the Chikukra project, they have uh, various fields which are set aside, which are organised by the community, which produce food for orphans and, and, and people with disabilities and stuff like that. So in, in that sense, that's an example of that. Another example would be a, a small rural town in Australia where someone uh, has set up uh, a, a hugely successful backyard garden and distributes free produce from 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 boxes out outside her her her, her yard and and now now other people are in the community who are also growing food in the same way are doing the same thing so i mean it's like it's not uh that, that this never happens and uh, what i'd also say about it is that every i mean Permaculture has been heavily involved in the community gardening movement internationally, and and like this community gardening movement often operates through uh, some some distribution by gift and certainly distribution in kind that people are not paying money for the vegetables, um, and, uh, and 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 what, what I think what you could also say is that permaculture trains people in sustainable agriculture at its best, and then people often go go away and make use of this. Um, to to you know like so so in a sense it's sp spreading out into the community and donating its ideas into the community for people to to make use of in various ways. Um, yeah, I mean I look I I don't I mean I I think I think that community supported agriculture is it also has to be considered as a gift to some extent in the in the sense that. Um, people are working for for peanuts, you know, like the, in that in that in that field, you know. Like the, and so, what what does that mean? It means that generally, as middle class people, they're they're foregoing a large part of their possible income by being involved in what they consider to be an ethical project. And 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 although they're selling their products to 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 the community, they're selling them at a price which doesn't really cover 
the labor costs if they were if they were being paid a normal the wage they could get in something else so in a sense it's a partial gift of products into the community at the same time you know like and like you know this question coming from the united states there's a huge urban underclass in the united states that really is is suffering from food shortages and i my 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 uh, view of that is that like yeah, permaculture people should be should be dealing with those issues, but it's very hard to. Um, I'm not sure if it's a big enough organisation, you know, a big enough social movement to actually to actually make a huge dent in that, you know. And I th I think the things that um, you know, like the, I was saying, the group in Oakland that are working on community gardens for black communities, I think that's probably the way to go, and that's what we should encourage uh, it, within the permaculture movement. And I certainly think that's within the the framework of permaculture people, you know, that to do to do that. Thanks. Well, I'm going to ask Anitra how the Beyond Money talk coming up on February 26 relates to today's talk on the politics of permaculture, because some of the good about half of the people here were not here when you started in the beginning, Anitra. Okay. Um, well, there's a, there's, there's a direct link, and it's quite personal. Um, I first got to know Terry because my um, late partner and I were editing a book called Life Without Money, Building Fair and Sustainable Economies, um, that came out almost exactly 10 years ago. And uh, I came across Terry's Gift Economy website, and realised that a lot of his um, uh, writing um, and political activities, um, though um, obviously impacted by anarchism, um, really kind of fit into a non-market socialist kind of context. And Life Without Money is more or less a, a non-market socialist collection. And um, since then, Terry and I have actually done quite a lot of work together. And indeed, the third chapter um, of Beyond Money, a post-capitalist um, strategy, uh, we did, um, was my part of a sort of dual act that we did at an Australian International Political Economy Network um, gathering a couple of years ago, just before... Um, all of the pandemic and lockdowns and everything. Um, so uh, we've engaged a lot together um, over these matters. And uh, as Terry said in his talk, you know, he feels that, you know, permaculture couldn't come in a sense into fruition unless it was along a non-monetary line. And um, my book, Beyond Money, a post-capitalist strategy very much engages with the ways that diverse movements are actually um, acknowledging and or particularly minor minority groups within them, um, all of the potential of um, non-monetary ways forward. One of the streams um, that feeds into all of this um, that might be of interest to Thomas and other people who are interested in Cuba is the um, debate um, in the mid-60s um, on the role of money in a transition to socialism. And indeed, back in the um, early 1920s, there was an extremely serious um, conversation um, amongst um, the Soviet um, Bolshevik range of kind of like um, uh, Russian economists of, at, at a very high level um, talking about the role of money um, and they played around, for instance, with the idea of replacing money with a calculation that was in energy. And, in fact, there's been um, numbers of these kinds of ideas and I go through some of these in my book um, and... Uh, Another important um, person back sort of like more in the 1930s was um, also arguing from, uh, for an in-kind um, economy from their German um, 
socialist government um, point of view. So uh, there, the idea of uh, a world without money or a society without money um, often seems like a bolt from the blue. But in actual fact, there's a long history of people who've been um, arguing um, these kinds of um, non-monetary economy arguments. And uh, so really my book looks at each of those. Um, I don't know if you want me to talk any more on that, but I think that's... Well, uh, Terry just got up for a sec, so it's okay. I'm, I do have another... Oh, there's Terry. So, yeah. Terry, okay. I, have a, I didn't write stack for myself, but the entire time I was listening, I, there was this other aspect in my brain that was thinking that a good part of our planet is production of food through the oceans and the rivers, etc. Is there some type of permaculture approach towards our relationship to bodies of water and the type of agricultural har harvesting that is being done there as food sources, and not just the aquatic fish life, but uh, the other products that are there to make this type of uh, production more sustainable. Yeah, I, permaculturists don't talk about um, the, that a lot. Um, well, they don't talk about it at all. I, I can't think of a single case. Um, but, I mean, clearly, I, I suppose they, they talk about it by implication in the sense that they talk about aquaculture, um, the implication being that you, you will not farm the oceans, you will farm... And they also talk about localising food production. So, again, that suggests that you will farm, um, you know, ponds and dams um, lo locally. Uh, and <clears throat> with aquaculture, and they have a lot of there's a there's a, a huge literature in permaculture about how to do that and various options where that's concerned. Um, so so I think the, the the implied answer to your question is hands off, <laughs> just let those stocks regenerate and and leave them alone for for a good while. Um, I, I also think that's important to realise too that within the framework of permaculture that. Um, the, the, the dominance of, of large um, livestock is something that permaculture is of, often critical of. Uh, and in, in my study of the Victorian situation, uh, I found that the Victorians are using at, at the present time something like, you know, 70% of the, the area, an area the same as Victoria for their food production. And like a huge amount of that is coming from livestock, you know, like 80% of the land that they're using is for livestock large livestock and permaculture basically believes in uh in, in either going to very vegetarian solutions like um pulses and stuff like that for protein or, or combining that with small livestock and they believe in you in um you know feeding the small livestock from the excess produced from from local food production you know from tree crops and uh, you know, agriculture and so on. And, and, and I've seen uh, in, in the context of the Chukukwa project, I've seen that that's perfectly possible, um, that, uh, you know, a house of six, a household of six people can, can su source sufficient animal protein from, from th having 30 chickens or 30, you know, 30 hens or whatever. It's not, it's not, it's not um, that difficult to do. And uh, like we could uh, release vast areas in, in, in the rich countries from, from agricultural pressure at the moment and have much more wilderness if we were to uh, st stop eating or, or, or ma massively cut down our eating of beef and lamb and, you know, la large livestock. Well, I, I read once and I can't cite it, and so I can't put that in chat. That there are there are is a large area of a trench, an underwater trench, east of New Zealand, um, has been emptied of much of aquatic life just for McDonald's to make their hybrid of seafood life fish, so-called fish sandwich, and that there are trawlers that just do like a mass grabbing of anything that's living there and mushing it into these cakes of seafood. And to me, this is, uh, how do we get from that type of treatment of our planet 
to something sustainable is uh, just uh, the education of the population seems a, a very daunting task in, in this regard, but we, we do have to do it one person at a time. I know that. Yep, indeed. I mean, I, I have now recalled on fa permaculture to Facebook um, discussions, uh, discussions of um, the idea of in, uh, creating huge rafts in the ocean to grow lots of seaweed to take carbon out of the atmosphere and also provide a um, habitat for, for fish uh, that, that could be eaten. I mean, and then and then replies from other permaculture people saying, you're thinking of using plastics to do this for just stop, you know, <laughs> stop there, stop right there. This is not 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 sustainable. So, you know, but um, but but, you know, like that goes along with what, what I was saying before, that permaculture people basically believe we should stop plundering the oceans for vast amounts of fish. It's crazy. Yes. Um I'm seeing Anitra has. Oh, that you just put the link for your talk there. That's that's what that is. Hey, Mary, Mary, can I call on you about what you did with your animals in Newark? Um, Mary, Mary lives in downtown yeah. Newark. Well, um, it's very small scale. This is a one person enterprise. So, um, I live in Newark next to a a vacant lot and the sidewalk was broken up and overgrown and a mess. So about 20 years ago or so, or maybe more, I did a little experiment. I did, dug up a little piece of the sidewalk and I planted it and it worked. And so now I have dug up all the way to the end of the street, except the last, I'd say the last 10 feet, I stopped digging and the sidewalk was a little more intact. So I built the soil up from the sidewalk. And then I, I decided to cut the fence um, of the lot. And so I expanded into that lot. And it's also like about, I don't know, 60 feet or so. So there's a sort of raggedy wire fence in between two sections of my garden. Um, and I have one, one raised bed towards the end. Now, the problem also was that this huge weedy lot, and boy, do I have respect for weeds. They just grow, was encroaching on my garden. And so there have been, you know, decades of my, my trying to come into compromise with these weeds. And now I have the solution. I've, I've used fabric to, to kind of keep them down and cover it with wood chips and line it with firewood. And so now it looks like a little farm. There's like a, a marked off um, wide path. Um, and uh, I've been, because this was land that had an apartment building on it in the past and when it was torn down as Newark does, the whole building was put into its basement, including all the years of asbestos paint and what have you. So I, I haven't, on the earth itself, I haven't grown anything to eat, but now I'm going into containers and I have one raised bed, so I can grow, I plan to grow a lot of tomatoes next year, which will just be for the taking. There is no fencing on this garden. Um, well, there is the section of fence, but it's, it's like wide open because I cut it. So, um, and the sidewalk was sidewalk, so it's totally accessible. Um, it actually is beginning to look like a little farm. And my big problem in the garden is the cat rescuers um, because I have feral cats who live in the garden. It's a nice place for them. And the cat rescuers, um, it's, it's, it's slow learning process for them to respect the garden besides respecting the cats. So there's that that goes on. And, you know, people like it. People wonder why I do it. Um, I'm, I guess my reputation is of, of being a little, um, heading towards insanity because obviously I'm not making any money on this. It's a poor neighborhood. Well, it's a mixed neighborhood. We're being redeveloped. So we're very mixed as far as income goes. Um, so I love it. It's good for my mental health. Um, and I, I learn more and uh, that, that's, 
Mary, you, you've had how many different animals in this yard as well? Or you've had well, in the animals? past, when I, my partner was alive, in the past, um, he, we, he mostly, but me, we really took over a different lot, a very large lot. It was a city-owned lot and turned it into a playground, fenced it, and had ponies for the children. Um, the ponies were brilliant. This was not my idea. They were brilliant because the ponies were small enough so that if they stepped on a child's foot, the foot would not break. It might bruise, but it wouldn't break. Um, they, were, they were ponies that didn't bite. You couldn't have biting ponies. And they were also small enough so that if a child fell off, the child would not get too hurt. So the kids rode them simply with halters, not with, with, with bridles. And um, the supervision was via the halters. So the kids would come and say, Andy, the straps, we want the straps. And then they'd get the halters and they'd chase the ponies. It would take them a long time to round them up. Um, and then once they did, because the ponies preferred not to be ridden. So once they caught the ponies and got the halters on, then they could ride for a while. And then after a while, um, we'd come and take the halters away and then the ponies could relax and have something to eat. Um, so it was a, a playground that had uh, had ponies, and we had a sky ride. Like um, they're around, um, you run a cable. We ran it vertically between the two points of this large oblong lot, um, and you you have a little platform where the kids can hang, you know, climb up, and then they go skimming across the whole lot. So the trick was to go skimming across the lot. And in the middle, drop off and land on a pony. That was not that easy to do. Um, but anyway, so that was last century. This was not recent. The well, city took over the lot. It has houses now. The, oh. This area, just so everyone knows, is the big sports team arena is only a few blocks away. And all the skyscrapers that Newark is starting to build, they're not that many blocks away. That's urban. It's, urban. it's very urban near where Mary is, but, but it, it is this this uh, this uh, really a sanctuary spot in the middle of. of it was. It was. It yeah. was. It's been you know, but um, I but know. still, I have my tiny farm. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. Oh, it's fun. It's fun, but it doesn't. You know, it's me. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't make the revolution. It doesn't change the, the trawling of that ocean trough near wherever. It doesn't, oh, well, <laughs> you know, it that, doesn't do well, any of that. <laughs> so well, you'd have to say that's a classic case of guerrilla gardening. That's what <laughs> it's Guerrilla gardening. Doing. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. I never asked anybody. I know you, are you, it would uh, disappear in a second. Well, the city so likes it. So the city isn't going to take back their sidewalk. That's amazing. So, I, one of the things that really uh, startles me when I when I uh, speak to people from the United States is how many suburbs in the United States have these really vicious codes, as they're called, which prevent pe people in permaculture from doing anything in their own backyard. This is really um, a feature of the United States that thankfully we don't have to deal with in Australia. Uh, the trick is to just do it. it, to just do it, because then someone has to take the initiative to make you stop doing it. Well, unfortunately, what I hear from permaculture people is that someone often does, and oh, it's very yeah. interesting yeah. to see to see that yeah. you're you're not plagued by that. Yeah, I think it depends on what part of what sort of suburbia you're in, really. Yeah. Anyway. You know, the, there is a movement in our sub suburb, which is not far from Mary, uh, for people. There are people that, not the the expensive uh, landscape designed wild yard, but to just stop mowing your lawn and let the lawn become what it becomes. But then the city come, came down hard on people <laughs> doing this kind of thing and fined them for not mowing their lawns. Uh, yeah, yeah. that would be right. Yeah. Amazing. That's Montclair. Montclair is wealthy. Hey, if you, know, if you live in a poorer area, you can, there's, there's, there's quote bad government often, although our government not right now isn't too terrible, but, um, you can get away with a whole lot more if you live in a poor area. So, so as the rich folk, you know, migrate to the suburbs to get away from the city, then then suburbanites could migrate to poor areas and and make gardens. Except 
that might yep. be problematic too. I don't know. I don't know the answer. So, but you can get away more with more in poor areas. Oh, yeah. So Terry, what are you are you developing more in permaculture, or do you have a new area that you're uh, working on a book, or what, what um, next? Well, my, mostly at the moment, um, I'm 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 working on my YouTube channel, which is called "What's Wrong with the World and How to Fix It." Uh -huh. um, so uh, uh, that that's um, my my main passion at the moment. Uh, and that could become a book at some point. But other than that, I'm kind of promoting my permaculture book, etc. And I'm engaging in various... What? I'm right typing that in chat. And how it's to, called how What's to Wrong fix. with the World and How to Fix It. And, and if you go to YouTube and type that in, you'll get there, correct? Yeah, yeah. You won't get in there by finding going for my name in YouTube. You have to put in the title of that thing. I'm just putting that in there so that when chat is recorded. Yeah, uh, it's got an apostrophe after what in what. Ah, uh, yes. As a typographer, I should have had that correct, Terry, but. Um, <laughs> I just think YouTube's very literal with this stuff. And apparently, I, 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 I've found, yeah, other than that, the, 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 the capitals are all right and so on. Cap A or lower A? And what you have there is correct. What's wrong with the world and how to fix it? A smaller A, yeah. There, got it. Oh, great. How good is that? All right. So um, I think that you've done a great presentation today, Terry, and, and I encourage everyone to read the book, and it's not something you need to worry about ordering. It's part of the open access program now, which means you just click on the link that I put on our site and you can go through Terry's book. Um, I, I, you know, once we started with Anitra, she comes back like once every year or every 18 months. So I'm going to certainly uh, call on you again, Terry, for a presentation down the road. And that'd be great. And I very much enjoyed today, even though I'm doing this in a, a 50 Fahrenheit room, which is kind of cold. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not easy, but it's, uh, it's what it is. So thank you, Terry. Thank you, Anitra. And see everyone. On, and thank you, Michael. And thanks, everybody. And see everyone back here on February 26th for Anitra's Beyond Money. Um, and, and uh, you know, for the our post capital transition to exchange or, or sharing, <laughs> I should say, because exchange right. implies market, and that's not what we need. So, thank you so much. Okay, bye. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Terrific.